Okay, well, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here to speak at this wonderful conference. So, I'm today going to talk about uh, how, how one can obtain complex transcendence by reducing M5 brains on the squash three sphere. So, it's related to this 3D, 3D correspondence, and this is work with uh, Clay Cordova's uh, postdoc at Harvard. Um, does this work? Ah, okay. So, right, so the, the idea is that you one may take the M5 brain world volume theory, the 2 0 theory in six dimensions, and re twist it on some three manifold to obtain a three dimensional n equals 2 theory, so a theory in three dimensions with four supercharges, and compute some partition functions of it, like these squashed sphere partition functions that we heard about in the last talk. And then there is some interesting conjecture that it's related to the partition function on the three manifold of some theory. And here we'll sort of derive this, this theory very directly by going through the relation of the 2 0 theory to maximally supersymmetric 5D Yang Mills. So I'll explain how that works. And a curious feature of it is that you start with some theory which is supersymmetric and end up with something without supersymmetry and with some non compact gauge symmetry, and somehow these two differences cancel out. Okay, so we heard a lot. Uh, earlier in the conference about the 2 0 theory in six dimensions, so I won't remind you about the details too much, but it's labeled by some ADE group and describes the dynamics of multiple M5 brains. And it has no marginal or relevant deformations, but we do think it's a local conformal field theory. And it's strongly coupled and doesn't have any Lagrangian description. Um, and one of the things we, we do know about it, which is going to be the main technique that I'll use in this talk, is that if you put it on a circle, it flows at low energies to the 5D maximally supersymmetric Yang Mills with the gauge, ADE gauge group. And of course, this theory in five dimensions, it's free in the infrared, weakly coupled, but it's strongly coupled in the ultraviolet, looks non-renormalizable. Um, so we even heard that maybe it could completely describe the 2-0 theory. That won't be relevant here because we're going to compute some supersymmetric quantity for which, so, of course, the 2 zero theory on the circle is some theory in 5D. Maybe it contains 5D Yang Mills plus a whole series of higher order operators. But it might be that if you compute some supersymmetric partition function, the higher order operators may be Q-exact, at least if you have enough supersymmetry. So this hasn't been analyzed in detail, exactly in which circumstances those higher order operators are Q-exact. It would be interesting to do that, but it's plausible. And in the context of this talk, this circle that you reduce on is going to be a small circle anyhow. So it you ones will be in the infrared free regime where it's definitely 5D angles. So in a sense, it doesn't probe this question. Okay, so one of the interesting things to, to do with this 2-0 theory is that it sort of unifies and provides a new window into lower dimensional uh, super conformal field theories. So we heard a lot about these kind of theories already. So if you put it on the Riemann surface, you get 4D n equals 2 theories. On three manifolds, which is the case I'll talk about, you get these 3D theories with four supercharges. And we even heard the talk about Gukov about testing it on four manifolds. These are studied a lot by Gaiotto and many people. Um, and of course, one of the interesting things about doing that is it gives you a different way to understand these superconformal theories. And some of them don't have Lagrangian, so it's a kind of new window into these, these space of field theories. And there are a lot of, so, so there's some interesting uh, duality, in a sense, that says that some observables, such as the sphere partition function of the resulting theories in 6 minus d dimensions after this supersymmetric reduction on the d-dimensional manifold M, is equal to the partition function of some particular theory on this space. And so in the case of reducing on a Riemann surface to get a 4d n equals 2 theory, there's the AGT correspondence that says that it's related to the 2D total theory on the Riemann surface. And in the 3D case, one expects to get this non-compact transcendence theory. So that's the thing that we'll, I'll derive today. And actually, you should, in the next talk, I think, might hear about a different kind of correspondence that perhaps doesn't fit into this picture because the theories can't always be obtained in this way from a six-dimensional starting point. Um, right. So. Those, these correspondences were understood in a 
in fairly intricate, uh, indirect ways. Here, I'm going to try to just drive it directly. So the starting point should be some background in six dimensions on the sphere times the manifold that preserves some supersymmetry and enough supersymmetry so that the partition function is just independent of the size of the manifold. So typically, deformations of the metric on this manifold will be Q exact in this situation. And then, so the, you can either reduce on the manifold and get this interesting theory whose sphere partition function you compute, or you reduce on the sphere and get the funny theory on the manifold. So that's what we want to do like this. So in other words, you can reduce to either first on the three manifold, either first on the three manifold to get this interesting theory, or first on the sphere and you'll find something and these have to be the same because it doesn't depend on the ratio of the size. Now, the first ingredient in doing this is related to the talk we just heard. How do you determine how to put this theory, say, in six dimensions on the sphere times the manifold so that you preserve supersymmetry? Um, so the idea is that if you coupled to off-shell supergravity, background supergravity fields, where you don't need to impose any supergravity equations of motion or reality conditions, just using it to keep track of certain terms in the dynamical Lagrangian, such that in the limit that you decouple gravity, you preserve some rigid supersymmetry. So I think in the last talk we heard how this works in great detail in four and in three dimensions, but here we want to do it in six dimensions and in five dimensions. So I'll explain how that works. Now, because the 60 theory doesn't have a Lagrangian, it's hard to just apply dimensional reduction. You, so even once you have this 60 supersymmetric background, you can't just write down 60 Lagrangian, reduce it, see what you get. A after all, that's the reason why these theories were so interesting, the theories you got by twisting it on the three manifold. But instead, if you find that your sphere has a circle isometry, which the spheres do, then you can reduce on that to obtain 5D Yang mills, maximally supersymmetric 5D Yang mills, in some background with various background fields turned on, preserving supersymmetry, and then it's straightforward to just derive the theory that you'll get on the three manifold, this Trent Simons theory that was predicted to find. So, yeah. Okay, so that's the motivation for going through five dimensions, because there you get a nice Lagrangian. Um, Okay, so in, in more detail, in this three-dimensional case, you want to take the theory of M5 brains on this three-manifold, and to get the 3DN equals 2 theory, you imagine it's a small three-manifold, and you want to preserve supersymmetry, so you twist on this three-manifold. It means that you had, out of the original SO5 R symmetry of the 2-0 theory, you take some SO3 subgroup and break to the diagonal of that with the SO3 rotation group. In other words, you turn on some background R gauge field living in this SO3 subgroup of the original R symmetry, and that enables you to preserve a total of four supercharges. I mean, in this case, you can think about it geometrically as having the M5 ring wrapping a three manifold living in where the normal directions were in the cotangent bundle. And then, in this case, you'll flow at long distances in the big three dimensions to some 3dn equals 2 theory, which is independent of the metric on the three-manifold, and say, in the case of a hyperbolic, compact hyperbolic three-manifold, it has no other flavor symmetry. So it's a very rigid kind of object. And these theories have been studied by th these and many other authors, and in some cases, Lagrangians are known for these 3D theories based on tetrahedral decompositions of these three-manifolds, and that typically leads to abelian trans-Simons matter Lagrangians, and it was this kind of reasoning that partially led to the conjecture of what you'll get on the reduced theory on the three-manifold. But finding these abelian Lagrangians is a little harder for compact three-manifolds for certain reasons. So anyway, this is just the part of the cast of characters. We won't use the Lagrangian of this theory. We're going to derive it in a different way from five dimensions. And then the quantity we're going to compute is these sphere partition functions. So I guess, as the last speaker told us, the squash sphere partition function is really the only supersymmetric invariant uh, which preserves that amount of supersymmetry. Well, the only one that preserves even one supersymmetry except for the extra ones that he mentioned at the end. Um, and 
it's a nice way to characterize these uh, 3dn equals 2 theories. So the round sphere partition function somehow counts the number of degrees of freedom. And they're comp it's computable from using localization. If you knew a uh, UV Lagrangian, which flowed to the infrared superconformal theory, and on the round sphere, it preserves some SU2 slash 1 times SU2 supersymmetry, uh, even in the non-conformal case. So the SU2 times SU2 are the rotations of the S3, and there are four odd generators, and you need to have an R symmetry. So we also, I also will talk about this generalization to the squash sphere. So there are different manifolds, which are sometimes called the squash sphere, and the partition functions are all the same, as Zohar uh, explained. So one that was discussed first was by Hama, Hosomishi, and Lee. It's some geometry like this, which you might call in the ellipsoid. But this one, although it has a circle isometry, the radius of the circle isn't constant. So it's not as useful uh, in the construction that I'm going to talk about today. But instead, there's a different squashing of the three sphere, which has the ex exactly the same partition function, where you just change the size of the hop fiber uh, and also turned on the R scalar and some other 3D background fields. And that preserves SU2 slash 1 times U1 supersymmetry. So you broke that SU2 down to U1. Okay. So th this is nice from the point of view of reducing the 60 theory to five dimensions because you reduce it on this hop circle, which has a constant radius. So it's a particularly simple background. So the conjecture was that, as I said, this squash sphere partition function of the theory you get by putting the M5 brains on the three manifold is given by some John Simon's partition function on the three manifold where the level is determined in terms of this squashing parameter. And from the point of view I'm describing here, it might seem kind of mysterious. How can some bosonic theory with an emergent gauge symmetry, this non-compact gauge symmetry, arise from reduction of a supersymmetric gauge there? Okay, so the answer is going to turn out that one gets complex Chern Simons. So let me remind you a little bit uh, how complex Chern Simons works. So it's like the ordinary Chern Simons action, but for a connection with the complex gauge group. So you may write it in terms of say A and A bar. And then there are some Chern Simons levels that I call Q and Q tilde, which don't have to be complex conjugates. And if I expand the complex connection A in terms of a real and a part A and an imaginary part X, then this takes this form. So the first bit looks like ordinary SUN Chern Simons. And then there's this other term. So one might call this the real part of the level and that imaginary part, but this doesn't have to be an imaginary number, right? Because Q and Q tilde don't have to be complex country yet in general. And then it has a non compact uh, gauge symmetry. So this theory is a little subtle because you can't try to regulate it using Yang-Mills because then you end up with the wrong sign kinetic terms because of the non-compactness of the gauge group. So it's somewhat subtle to define non perturbatively and Witten has written a lot of papers related to that. Now, if I don't do anything of this more subtle type, changing the contours of integrations for the field, then you would say that this level k has to be an integer so that this part is invariant under large gauge transformations, just like in SUN, Chern Simons theory. And then the, the level here, U, has to be either real or pure imaginary to get an action which is reflection positive. Whether it's real or imaginary depends on whether you consider the one form X to be uh, parity even or parity odd. And in fact, in both, ca both cases will appear in uh, what we find. And I, I should also mention that it's a very similar story if you took the 3D n equals 2 theory and computed not squash sphere partition function, but the S2 times S1 partition function, like the super conformal index, and there's some similar conjecture there. So, and the logic is similar. You will reduce now not on S3, but on this space, and get some theory on the three manifold. And using somewhat similar techniques, Yagi and Sang Jae Lee and Yamazaki show that you get complex Jun Simons where this, the real level is K and the other one is pure imaginary. So, as I said, we go through this 5D intermediate stage uh, in order to be able to write down a Lagrangian, and then everything is purely constructive. Once you have this background preserving supersymmetry, you just reduce here, then you can write down a 5D Lagrangian, dimensionally reduce on the two sphere, 
and end up with some theory on M3 whose partition function must be the same as this. So it's the guy we want. Now, this reduction, it's like Hopf reduction of S3 to S2. So you get not, of course, just the two sphere, but there's also one unit of gravity photon flux. In other words, there's the, coming from this off diagonal piece in the metric. And to preserve supersymmetry, you have to turn on various other background fields. And as I said, the 5D Yang Mills is non, I mean, naively non renormalizable theory, which has G Yang Mills given by the radius of the hop circle. But here we actually wanted, we're interested in limit where you take the three sphere to be small. So this is a small circle. So it really looks like the weakly coupled Yang Mills, anyhow. So it's, it's sort of the best limit of this description. And as I said, one needs to have, at the beginning, found a complete 6D background, which preserves supersymmetry to start the whole thing. And obviously, it involves twisting on the three manifold, but something else on the square sphere uh, of the style that Zohar talked about. But here, we want to do it in six and in five dimensions. So then we'll reduce to five dimensions to get this to write down a Lagrangian, which looks like maximally supersymmetric yang mills coupled to various background fields. So how does it work? So you need to study the 5D maximal supergravity. And the only thing that one is interested in is just the, su just the fermion variations um, so that you, one will to find the conditions for preserving some rigid supersymmetry. And of course, you want the background fields also to respect all of the bosonic symmetry as you expected to have, rotational invariance on the two sphere, et cetera. And you can, one can obtain the 5D maximal supergravity by reduction of the 60 offshell conformal supergravity. And in fact, in this case, this dimensional reduction is particularly nice because both the 60 and 5D uh, supergravity theories have the same SO5R symmetry. So you don't, there's nothing else in the 5D supergravity than what you get from this reduction. And of course, it generalizes 5D supergravity that had eight supercharges that have been uh, understood some time ago. So I won't go into this background supergravity theory very much. Um, but of course, it has a metric and the R gauge field, which is the SP4. And then there's some interesting uh, three-form, so, some self-dual three-form field, which transforms into five of the SO5 R symmetry and then a bunch of scalars. And when you reduce to five dimensions, it proliferates a little bit because the metric will give you 5D metric, also the diloton, like the size of the circle you reduced on, the gravity photon, and likewise for some of the other fields, like you get an R scalar, et cetera. And this uh, three form will reduce to some two form in five dimensions. You don't get the three form because it was self dual up here. And now the good thing about being in five dimensions is that you can write down the 5D Yang Mills action in complete generality coupled to these arbitrary 5D background fields. So the only uh, things to note here, so you get, of course, a lot of mass terms which are related, yeah, sort of like curvature couplings of masses. And then there are some other interesting terms. So the gravity photon appears here. In a, so this is the gravity photon. This is the dynamical gauge field. So this is a kind of uh, 3D type John Simon's term. And it's the familiar Ramon Ramon uh, John Simon's term that appears on the, the four brain world volume. So this guy is like the F2 flux. And yeah, so it's like usual D brain John Simon's term. And then there's this interesting uh, term which couples the scalar to the field strength together with when you turn on these background two form and some kind of uh, cubic potential for the scalars when the R scalar is turned on. And th this guy doesn't have any obvious six dimensional origin you, because you don't know what the six dimensional non-abelian theory is. So just work it out by trying to find supersymmetry in five dimensions. So once you have this action, then you can just proceed. So the background, the general background is a little complicated, but it's slightly simpler to understand in the case when the sphere is the round sphere, because then note that uh, ADS3 or H3 times S3, when they have equal radii, is conformally flat. So even if I didn't know about this whole story of coupling to background supergravity, I could have just put the two zero theory into that space. And now I didn't want to study the theory on H3, I wanted to put here a general three manifold. So the first step is to convert H3 to R3. And I can do that by topologically twisting. So first I map conformally here, then I topologically twist H3 to R3. And it's a little bit unusual 
because the theory in R3 is already the twist of the theory. In a sense. It's different, that, but that's because I have this three sphere here. Okay, so that's, that was a, a much simpler way to understand the case with the round sphere. In general, in the squashed case, it, that trick doesn't work and all of the background fields are required, including this self-dual two form and this R scalar, etc. So I won't go into this in great detail, uh, but let me just say that the, right, so, so this, is, this is the answer and it, all these parameters are completely determined by preserving supersymmetry. And it depends on the squashing parameter L. L equals one is the round sphere. And L, yeah, okay. Okay, so once one has that, you just plug it into the 5D Yang-Mills Lagrangian, coupled to those background fields and dimension reduced on the two sphere. And it's completely straightforward because you have this weakly coupled Lagrangian. You want to think of the half fiber as being small because you're interested in limit when the three manifold is big and the sphere is tiny. So it's, the simple, so just the light, the light fields that survive this dimension reduction are the modes of the gauge field with legs along the three manifold that are constant in the two sphere and constant modes of the scalar, in particular modes of the fermions. And of course, there are no one cycles in S2, so there's nothing else from the gauge fields. And one of the non-trivial things is that the fermion action isn't diagonal in the mass basis. So in other words, if I only looked at the massless modes of the fermions, then they won't be the ones that get coupled together by the Dirac term in five dimensions. So uh, it's not allowed to just truncate to the massless fermions at the beginning. You have to keep all of them that can talk to each other at the, you know, at the linear order right. and then integrate out the massive ones. Okay, so that, that's important for a certain reason. Okay, now in the gauge sector, as I said, the main effect is that you have this John Simons term and because on S2, you have the integral of this gravity photon is one because of, it was the hot vibration, you end up with this churn simons term for the SUN gauge field at level one. And then there's, of course, also the Yang-Mills, but that disappears in the limit that I take the three sphere to be very tiny. So I'll just get the churn simons theory on the three manifold, SUN, the ordinary SUN churn simons So, so far, I don't see any complex gauge group, but when I look at the scalars, the, it turns out all five of the scalars and the five of SO5 remain massless. The zero modes on the sphere remain massless. But they naturally decompose in the breaking of the R symmetry to the SO3 that I used in the twist thing and the unbroken U1, just like the U1 of the 3DN equals 2 theory. And, right, that's, so I just said that. Now, there is something interesting because the fields X, which are the ones that are in the three of this SO3, are charged under the R gauge field, which is turned on in the R3 uh, because of that, that background field is turned on. So in other words, if I expand out the original gate covariant kinetic terms, which included the R gauge field, I'll pick up something that takes this form um, because I have R gauge field X derivative X. So it looks like some one derivative type of kinetic term. And when one works out all the group theory, it turns into a nice structure like this, which looks a lot like a Chern Simons type term. And then the interesting coupling of the scalars to the field strength gives you this term in the squash case when one has turned on the uh, two form background field. So you get an action of this type. Now it's starting to look a little bit like complex Chern Simons. And then for the fermions, as I said, it's a little more complicated because you have to keep track of also some that become massive because they mix together. So the massless ones are these lambdas, but the Cs, but for instance, the kinetic term it takes this form, epsilon and B are just these matrices. So the kinetic term couples the massless fermion to these massive ones. And so in order to find the action, you have to integrate out the massive fermions. And so you end up with kinetic term for fermions, which has two derivatives. So that sounds a little bit strange, but it also explains how the whole thing works. And then there are some non-abelian terms uh, that come from the Yukawa couplings and the bosonic potential, this cordic potential. And then there was also this interesting cubic potential that came because of one of the background fields. So I don't have time to go into extreme detail, but at the end, you changed 
the contour of integration of the field X. So no, remember, in the original theory, it was just 5 Yang mills, so everything had to have correct sign kinetic terms in the uh, Yang mills action. But if I change, rotate X to IX, then it's natural to combine it together with the gauge field A to make some complex one form. But at this point, there's only SC1 gauge symmetry acting on A. There's no gauge symmetry acting on X. It's just a one form. It came from a scalar field. But I had these funny fermions, which had a two derivative action. So you can probably see how it's going to work. Um, so first of all, the action looks invariant, almost invariant, under a new symmetry, which looks like the rest of the complex gauge symmetry, except for one term, which takes this form. So it's the A covariant derivative, covariant divergence of this one form x, if you like, squared. And that looks a lot like gauge fixing term. So that's indeed how it all fits together. There's one slight complexity that in the non-abelian case, the action for these lambdas, which I now should think of as ghosts, and the other two scalars, y, looks nonlinear. It has these Yukawa couplings of, uh, yeah, of y and, or complicated couplings of y and lambda and things of that type. But it turns out all of the nonlinear pieces are independently q-exact, so I can just remove them. Now, when, right, so I, so I have only these four massless fermions left and the y's. And after I use this Q equivalence to eliminate the nonlinear part of the ghost action, one ends up with exactly the fermions and these scalars y, whose determinant is precisely the Fedeyev Popov determinant of gauge fixing that non compact part of the gauge symmetry using that gauge fixing term. And I should say, Usually in the Fedeyev Popov gauge fixing, there are only two fermions. Here we have four, and the extra two are canceled by the y's, which have an identical action once you eliminated the nonlinear terms by this Q exact deformation. So, therefore, in the end, one sees that the squash sphere partition function of this 3D theory on the three manifold is exactly the partition function of the three manifold of the GC Chern Simons theory with the level K1 and the other level square root of 1 minus L squared. And note that depending on whether L is bigger or less than 1, you get both branches of reality condition. So that was all I wanted to say. Thanks. Questions or comments? Uh, I, you, you said this, but I sort of missed it. Can you say again how... Oh, what the answer to the question you asked in the middle of the talk was that why you didn't get an explicitly supersymmetric action? Oh, well, I mean, the action is, is supersymmetric, but the fermions get reinterpreted as ghosts. So that, that's why they disappear, if you like. Roughly speaking, the supersymmetry turns into the Fede of Popov type of supersymmetry. It looks, sort of turns into BRST supersymmetry of this gauge fixing. Any other? Oh, uh, if not, oh, then. So, I'm sure this was clear at the beginning. But just, just for clarity, what you did at the beginning was you twisted in a way that made the theory topological along M3, but not along S3. Yes. So you did a f physical calculation along the S3, and then the topological field theory you got on the M3 was churn Simons. Yes, yes, that's right, exactly. Okay, let, let's thank Daniel again. <laughs>